Dumlang Dumlang hello it's simply special here and welcome back to my youtube channel but also a special welcome to you if you are listening to the audio version of this on the podcast simply do the work available wherever you listen to your podcast today's episode is a special one because i had the incredible honor of having Timberly Kengai as a guest and we spoke about her diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy type 3 going up with a disability as well as how can able bodied people be good allies to the, to the disabled community we also spoke about mental health amongst many other things and so without any further ado let's get into this conversation okay so um hi everyone today i have a very special guest with me to here and i an anthologized essayist who's passionate about inclusive education and disabled sex thank you so much to for making time how are you good so how are you it's so nice to be on your show I'm good. I'm excited. You're officially the first guest on yes. the podcast. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah. Is... yeah. So this is a huge and a lot of pressure, but I, I, I hope I live up to it. <laughs> no pressure at all. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more. I'm so I understand that you were diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy type three. Mm-hmm. So could you just tell us more about what it is and how does it affect you on your day-to-day life and even growing up because I understand you're diagnosed as a child right yes yes okay yeah so the year is 1999 I'm living in a village with my grandparents which is the story that most of us as black kids are familiar with you know the parents mm-hmm. go off to work they leave it with your grandparents So it's 1999 and I'm with my grandparents and they start to notice that whenever I um, come home, I crawl up the three steps onto our veranda. Or if I've fallen, it's difficult for me to get up. They also notice that if they ask me to hurry up, I I can't do so, you know. So we were lucky enough and, and my mom and I always tell this story. We were lucky enough to have someone in the family who was in in, um, the the medical field. Um, I think she was a nurse. And she said, let me tell you something. What's happening to this child right now needs investigation. Don't take it as, and it's because we call it Udali Welomdana, which is, this was God's plan, you know. So Mm. um, we went to doctors. Um, at the time, I was living in a rural village called Ibandingville after Imtata in the Eastern Cape in the Trans Sky. And so we go to doctors, Imtata, and they say, hey, we got to shoot this up to the top because we're not familiar with the symptoms or what they could mean. So I was sent to East London. In East London, they took blood tests. They did gene testing. And the results came back and I was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy type three at the age of six in the year 2000. And a lot of people always ask me, you know, how did you feel? Because you were so young at the time. Did you understand Mm. what this disease meant? And I always tell them I did, you know, and I can narrate my whole story. I can tell you what the doctors said, uh, even though I was so young, but I was super conscious and very self-aware that there's this thing that I have that um, disables me from being able to swing on the swings at school or go into the jungle gym and all of those things. And so I saw it in relation to uh, my childhood at the time. I didn't think about it in the future because spinal muscular atrophy has a prognosis of paralysis, you know? So I didn't as a child think that far, but I just knew in the immediate that it meant I couldn't play sport, I couldn't do this and all of that. So just a little bit of a brief about what spinal muscular atrophy is. So spinal muscular atrophy is a wasting away of um, the proximal muscles, you know, so the muscles closest to the body. And Mm. the, the, the science behind it is that There's a protein that the body is supposed to make that is responsible for motor um, movements or movements or for for motor skills. And in people with spinal muscular atrophy, um, they don't have that protein. And so that's why um, it, it then degenerates and you're unable to walk long distances, you know, jump, um, get out of bed, have trouble with 
um, climbing upstairs and so forth. So the prognosis is paralysis, uh, but the, the progression takes quite a while. Um, for instance, I was diagnosed when I was six and I only stopped walking at the age of 21. And I think I could have walked a little bit more, but we'll get into that a bit later. So that's, that's in essence what it is. It is a rare disease. Um, it's not as rare as others, but it is a rare disease. And it's actually more prevalent in boys than it is in girls. And so when I was diagnosed, my um, pediatrician invited his uh, colleagues within the practice. And he was like, you won't believe what disease she has. And he was like, she has spinal muscular atrophy. And they were all like asking my mom, are you sure she's a girl and not a boy? <laughs> and my mom was like, yeah, I'm sure. So that's like just a funny story about this whole diagnosis thing. But yeah, that's, that's a little bit about SMA. Right now, I'm permanently in a wheelchair and rely on a what we call a personal assistant. Most people will call them caregivers. But that term has been phased out by the disabled community because we're not we're not ill, we're not frail, so we're not getting mm. we're not we don't we don't use the term caregivers particularly like I'm useful, I'm vibrant, so caregiver makes me seem like um you know in bed every day and I'm weak or whatever. So um, now I rely on a personal assistant to. Get, help me get into the shower. I bath myself, but she then has to come and wipe me. And then she lotions me as well, helps me get dressed. You know, um, I sleep with my mom at night. So she has been responsible for helping me to the bathroom, turning me in bed, you know. Um, and it's, it's so interesting because even little things like um, blankets are too heavy for me to be able to you know, turn on my own. And people are like, what? That's such a, yeah, that's such a thing I would Something you take, take for granted. granted. Exactly, take for granted. And so that's kind of the nature of SMA right now for me. Um, but yeah, in a chair, really enjoying it, proud to be in a chair um, and not letting the, the, the prognosis kind of simmer in my mind all the time. I'm living in the now, um, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, that's it. Wow. That is like, you may open my eyes to, you know, such yeah. low things that I probably wouldn't have yeah. considered or even yeah, thought about. Exactly. Exactly. So you mentioned how even at six years old, you were, you know, aware and conscious. So I mm -hmm. wonder how did that uh, manifest in school? I understand you went to a normal school, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I went to mainstream school. But again, a really um, funny story about that. So I was living in a village at the time of my diagnosis. And by the time I turned 10, my doctors were like, she has to come and be closer to us for checkups um, and to access health care. You know, you asked mm -hmm. something earlier and I was like, yeah, access to health care. So I had to move from the village to the urban areas to access better health care. And in the process, my pediatrician wrote to the school um, that I was in Clarendon. It's a public-private um, uh, school, really good school in East London, and said to them, I have this patient who has this disease. I think she would benefit from being in this environment with children of all kinds of, you know, not disabilities, but children from all walks of life. You know, and he explicitly said, I don't want her to go to a special school because I feel like that would delay um, her progress in life. And so that's how I ended up in a mainstream school. And in terms of my experiences in that mainstream school, at the time, it didn't dawn on me that there were so many ways that I was excluded in school. You know, uh, a lot of people will tell you they think I'm really brave. And, you know, I'm this take it as it comes, very optimistic person. And that was actually really true. I never, I'll tell you, for instance, like when there was a five kilometer walk in school, um, I couldn't do that walk. So I would be in the mm. bus that monitored the girls going to the destination and coming back. And so it's only now in my like late 20s 
way I'm beginning to interrogate my experiences as a child in a mainstream school. And I'm seeing those experiences for the first time as absolutely horrible, you know, but then I took it in stride, you know, if there was sport, I would just be there to support. If there was physical education and people had to swim or had to play netball, I would be on the stands, you know? And I talk about, um, in an essay that I wrote two years ago, about always being on the periphery, always being in the wings, waiting for a cue, waiting for someone to say, come play with us or come swim with us or, you know, all of these activities that children did at that age. And I never got that cue. Um, and so, so yeah, so I'm now beginning to be like, no, man, you, you, you weren't living the life that you thought you were living. But I'm glad yeah. I didn't. I'm so glad that at the time I didn't see that because I think it would have really overwhelmed me and I would have found myself a little bit lost. Um, it's okay that I'm realizing it now, um, now that it's already happened. Um, and I feel sad for the me, you know, who was in these positions or always on the periphery, but at least it's over, you know, and now mm. um, I can contribute to the disability agenda and ensure that kids who are like me don't have the same experiences that I did. Mm, so you'd say like your experiences growing up is what sort of also influences your work now, even on like the educational and inclusivity. I think I probably would have benefited that from that growing up because I think a lot of us we often told don't don't point at them, don't like we usually yes. don't even know how to interact to the yes. point where it seems like we end up just avoiding people who are different from us because we're so exactly. scared of offending them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I actually, I, I made, this, uh, I did a speech a couple of years ago for the Department of Education in the province in the Eastern Cape, and I reiterated a, something that happened to me in university. In my first year of university, I noticed that a lot of people were a little bit confused about me, you know, and maybe the confidence that I had. They were a little bit like, this doesn't gel. This person is disabled. I've always seen disabled people in disempowered situations. I've seen them being homeless. You know, they sometimes in these centers where they all live together. And now you have this brilliant doing journalism disabled person. And it's like, they don't know how to reconcile what they've always known about disabled or what they were taught about disabled people with the reality. And so we were walking back from class one time and someone, and I was very open, I've always been very open about my disability. I, I always want to share my experiences. And so upon hearing my um, story about just challenges that I've experienced in my life, um, someone that I was walking with said, well, congratulations for coming to university. And because of the way that I'd grown up, I found that like really strange. I was like, congratulations, Gandhi, what do people do after high school? The next <laughs> move, the next move yeah. is university, come on. Yeah. Congrats. Um, and it, and it, I realized later that because they had never, because our school system is not integrated and you don't see disabled people in equal positions that you are, you don't see them playing sport with you, you know, you don't see mm. them sitting in classrooms with you or engaging, maybe doing debating, or all of those things. It was difficult for her to understand how I got to this place. And so she, she was like, this is kind of a miracle because from what I know about disabled people, they're not even in schools, you know, or if they are in schools, it's special schools. And they then go on to like vocational um institutions where they do like pottery or whatever. So it was so jarring for her that I was in a traditional university. I'd been in a mainstream school and I was this person who really didn't let the disability like prevent her from doing anything, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of us, we think someone has disability is at home getting a grant and yes, there's yes. someone else who's yes. constantly doing everything for them. You know? Yes, exactly. So it's funny enough, like, I'm currently rotating pediatrics, and yes. yesterday we saw uh, a patient who has epilepsy, 
And apparently the school asked her to stop coming to school, not because she's struggling or anything, but because they said whenever she has the fits, it's traumatizing the other students. And so, you know, the doctor was saying, you know, it's very unfortunate. A lot of kids, because of, you know, for example, even kids who have ADHD, they're often seen as troublesome, they're seen as problematic. Like instead of actually supporting these kids, they rather just, you know, pick you out, tell you to stay home, like we don't want to stop like you so as you're saying, push to the periphery. It's that mm. sort of marginalization. And it's it's really sad. And I think that's why I was really interested in like your story and the work that you mm. do because I mm. think as a country, we have a long way to go. Yeah, no, there's so much work that still needs to be done within the education system. Um, at the time that I was making my speech, there were 500,000 children with disabilities who were still languished out of the school system. So you ask yourself, what are half a million disabled children doing if they're not in school? And it would be an absolute uproar if non-disabled, if non-disabled children, half a million of them were not in education. That would be a crisis. Definitely. The country would stand up, you know, and, and, mm. and, and strike and protest and say, we need our kids in school. But there's very little voices that are raising up and saying, we have half a million children who are at home, you know, and what are their ages? Some of them have already passed the school age and cannot then be brought into. This. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, and I think it's so important to, to just um, raise these issues in, in whatever platforms that we have, you know, because nobody else is going to talk about it. Those kids don't have anyone to 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 talk for them. Uh, it's just them. It's their parents, and they are in, in situations where they don't have the power that we have. They don't have the the resources that we have. Um, they don't have the kind of platforms that we have. Oh my YouTube! I mean, these are the conversations we should be having um, as youth, alongside other dialogues where um, people are facing discrimination based on. Um, all kinds of, you know, their gender, their, um, you know, sexual orientation, etc. Definitely. And I think also there's a role that able-bodied people such as myself also play mm -hmm. because you can't just put all the work that only disabled people should speak up for themselves. And so I was wondering, what are some actionable things or what advice would you give for someone who's maybe, as they listen to this, like, okay, I wasn't aware of this problem. Mm -hmm. What can I do? Because somehow it can be overwhelming when you see yourself like as an individual, like how do I tear down this entire system? Yeah, look, I think for me, the biggest action is in the small actions. And what I mean by that, I even did a, a little video or story um, a couple of days ago. And I was saying, I've seen so many people on social media um, basically saying they'd love to get in an accident so they can receive the payment from REF um, and so forth. And, I was, and I've always found that so strange. And for me, um, it's okay that I go on big platforms and I talk about these things, but we need to, in every small circle of ours, um, consider disabled people, you know, call out somebody who's ableist on Twitter. Like that yeah. action in itself is a big action. You don't have to have a loud hailer, you know, shouting the rights of disabled people, have marches and all of that. You just, in your own communities, need to educate people or say, like, for instance, with my mom. My mom is, is not part of an older generation, but in some ways she still holds um, the values that older generation people have. And sometimes she will make like a xenophobic comment. And no one's watching. I'm not on the stage. You know, I'm not videoizing this for the camera, but I say to her, don't say that. Like, mm. you know, Nigerians don't sell drugs. There are other people also who sell drugs and so forth. And so we need to, in each of our spaces, continue to educate people or say, your friend, I just learned recently that the term um, retarded is actually inappropriate and it hurts disabled people who are neurodivergent and so forth. So and I said to mom, like, don't use the term anymore, yeah, but just like that, you know? Yeah. You, 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 you're, not, you're not on a big stage, you're not 
um, trying to get the attention. You're not trying to get the glory of educating. But in your small circles, your friend passes it on to their friend and their friend tells their parents. And so that's how we, we then undo this discrimination and, and, and so forth. So for me, that's number one is the biggest action is in the small actions. And yeah, and, and, I, and I think as well, um, just follow people who have differing opinions or experiences than you. You know, I, I, I like to follow people who I'm like, my life is like night and day with theirs. And that's where you get to learn things, you know. It's okay to follow your squad or your clique or people who agree with you and have the same values. That's great. But let's also just open ourselves up to learning, even just by following a disabled person. Because disabled people will post a lot of information. And you just gather these nuggets of information mm. and be like, oh, I didn't know that. And then you're like, yo, I heard this thing. Oh, you tweeted about it. And that and that's how we 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 change the world for me. Definitely, I can relate to that because I know mm-hmm. during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time online, and mm-hmm. then that's when I start actually learning about people who are neurodivergent, yes. and even the use of tone indicators in tweets, which is you know something. And I think also when we're learning something, sometimes we can be a bit apprehensive to new information. Mm-hmm. At first, I was like tone indicators, so what is this? But then yes. I actually looked into it. So okay. Some people, they really can't tell the difference, you know, whether you're being sarcastic, whether you're joking. So just right. simply indicating and just say, oh, this is a joke, by the way. This, Especially, mm. I think, on Twitter, which is a public platform where yes. anyone can see. You don't really know how the person receiving it yes. can um, react to that. Yeah. So I want to know how... I've noticed that, you know, a lot of your work, like you, I've read a few of your essays, are quite personal. Do you ever get any... Um, fear like how will people respond to this because i know i sort of get that when i make a podcast like, okay how will people react to this very vulnerable story of mine because you can never know it's like once something is out there it no longer belongs to you but the world so how do you navigate that that's the reason i don't have a youtube channel people have been asking me and i was like mm. comments you know because people just speak people just speak True. and now you're offended and you're like but that wasn't what i meant and that's not how my life is, you know, or sometimes you internalize these things. So for me, I think, uh, particularly with the essay, um, my friend sent me a call to um, submission for um, archive Amabali Oetu's African Feminist Anthology series. And I just found myself, I never even thought that I'd write about dating. Because I usually write about inclusive education. And I never thought I'd write about dating as a disabled person and what that's meant for me and how we can facilitate um, disabled people also having their own fairy tales. And so when I wrote it, I was like, you know what? If no one ever reads this, I'm so glad I penned it because I penned it for myself, you know? And I think it's important to just know that there are people, there's someone out there who's going to be touched by what, by what you were saying. Because I never, even though I was fearful about critiques and so forth, um, particularly critiques about how my mom raised me, I just had to be like, that's it, someone's going to get touched by this thing. So just write it. And even if no one ever likes it, even if it's never been published, it's an important piece of work. It's it's, it's a radical piece of work. And so I think for me, as, as minorities, as people who are marginalized, I think we always have to take everything that we do, whether it's a podcast, whether it's um, an essay, whether it's tweets, a thread on Twitter, as, as, as radical. Because we, we, yeah, because we are minorities and ours is just to shed light no matter how it's received you know somebody out there is watching you somebody out there is reading what you're writing and slowly but surely they're changing their minds or they're seeing things mm-hmm. in a different light than they were before because of your work so i think that's where my fearlessness um came in i was like i'm doing this for myself 
but I'm also hoping someone out there, it will resonate with someone out there. And it did, it resonated with a lot, with a lot of people, disabled people, non-disabled people. Uh, and that was rewarding. But um, even if it had just been one person who, who was, you know, could relate, for me, that would have been my biggest success. Wow, that is beautiful. And I can relate to so I feel like whenever you create something for yourself first and it comes yeah. in, it's like and your intentions are in the right place. Yes. And like you say, it all matters. You just, just need one person yes. to respond. Just one yes. person who says, you know what, this touched me, this made a difference yes. in my life. Because certainly when I read it, I was like, I can, even though I'm not disabled, I can yeah. relate to this. And yeah. I think it's because of your vulnerability, just looking at like the humanness, you know, and also, but also seeing how there are things that I can't relate to, but also learning from it. Absolutely. Yeah, really do that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering if there were any like common microaggressions you get from well meaning people who might be trying to help or they think they're just being polite that you could just shed some light on. Um, oh my word, there's so many. <laughs> there are so many. And I got asked this. I was doing, I was um, a consultant for McCain Foods and doing um, an inclusive workplace talk for them. And at the end, they had a question and answer session and they asked me, so tell us just like the do's and don'ts of um, interacting with disabled people, etc." And I went blank and I was like, what are the do's and don'ts? And I went blank and I, and I, I'm struggling to find all these microaggressions. I'll, I'll tell you a few because I I let those things fall off my shoulder. You know, there was a mm. time where I was like, that's such a mean thing to say. You know, why did they say that? Now I'm like, I, it doesn't even click to me. It doesn't even permeate to me because I'm like, so, so self, um, what is this? So confident in who I am and so proud of being disabled that no one can take that away from me. But some of the microaggressions that I faced, particularly when I was still transitioning from being able to walk to using the chair, a lot of people were trying to get me to walk again. I was trying to get me to walk again. And what that basically said is that people cannot accept you in the wheelchair so the people who are like i want you to walk again try this try this try this those people couldn't accept me as a wheelchair user and that was a really deep thing for me to to realize and other microaggressions let me think um hmm why am i blank Maybe we can come back to this one because we I'm can come back. So to it, many, yeah, but I'm just like I need to think because I don't allow them in my space. You know. Yeah. Um, let's come back to that one. Let's come back to that. No one. problem. But you know, while you were talking, actually, you remind me once I listened to a podcast. Um, mm -hmm. God is great, and she had a guest. I can't remember the exact disability. The guest was I think she was blind or deaf. And yes. she's saying something that used to happen a lot. So it's at church, people try to pray for her to be healed against her consent. So I was wondering if you've ever had such experiences. Um, yes, I've had a lot of people um, invite me to church. My mom is a very staunch um, church goer. You know, she's a church leader. Um, she, she's, she's, yeah, so she loves the church. And I, I watched one of your videos where you said you have issues with the institution that is the church and i have the same mm -hmm. issues that you have the church is not a good place and i've also had people try to cure me you know asking is there nothing that can happen um they've asked to to pray for me um even shows for me like those um church shows where someone comes in in a wheelchair and they healed. And mm. I even had those experiences in my workplace where people will say, nah, I had um, back pain for 20 years and I went to Dr. So-and-so. And they then keep following up with you on, did you Google, did you not? 
And I had to say to people, and I say it all the time, I have no problem with being in a chair. I wouldn't change anything. Um, there is gene therapy that is um, being used on SMA patients. It's working. It's slowing down the progression. I don't want it, you know, and people find it difficult to accept that I'm enjoying. They think that you're pretending when you say, no, I love being in a chair or whatever. Yeah. So I have, I also have the same issues, the praying for the traditional healers, the um, maybe if you go to gym or exercise or, or whatever, all these interventions, um, I've had a lot of them. Um, and, and most of them have been the, actually the biggest microaggression is people that say, I'll pray for you to walk again. No, pray for me to be happy with the situation I'm in, you know, don't yeah. to change. Just be like, I, I pray that she continues to grow and love herself and, and, and all of that. So yeah, because microaggression is, is definitely church and the praying. And the praying. Yeah. I can yeah. imagine. Because it, I, like I'm, I, I wear glasses, and I had a phase where I was like, you know what, I, I want to pray to get my sight back. I want to see, but at some point, I just, you know, I just accepted that, you know, it's okay. Yeah. Like now I'm kind of like I'm wearing contact lenses. It's like you know what, the situation is like manageable, and I think you know even just our ideas on on like bodies and how bodies should function yes. just also needs to like change. I was asking if um. What is your relationship like with your body and if there's any sort of embodiment work or exercises that you do? Yeah, I had a lot of, um, and I think I still do in so many ways, body dysmorphia, um, particularly in the beginning. So I used to be very, very uh, small. I have a small frame. I'm big. My, I, I've gained a lot of weight, but I have a small frame. And I used to be very tiny. 39 kilograms was my normal weight, you know? And so I was diagnosed then with depression in 2015. I started using antidepressants. And if anyone knows anything about antidepressants, the first place they will go, before they even go to the serotonin, they're coming for your weight, you know? Yes. So, I, so, yeah. I a, yeah, so I gained a lot of weight. And that was the first time my body dysmorphia started. And again, we were talking earlier about microaggressions. You know, um, people kept trying to help me lose weight. You know, um, they couldn't accept that I was gaining weight. I remember my mom saying to me, when you go to your psychiatrist, tell her to take you off these medica this medication. You're fine now. And um, it was so interesting because I wasn't fine. You know, I was in a psychiatric mm. hospital for uh, three weeks and I did, um, what is it called? Shock therapy, I forgot the name. I did shock therapy uh, a few times. I don't, can't remember how many times, I think six times. So yeah, I did shock therapy six times, but it didn't work because I actually had been mis misdiagnosed. Um, so I relapsed and she was there saying, no, tell her to take off these meds. But anyway, in terms of body dysmorphia, that's where my body dysmorphia started. You know, I couldn't accept that I was bigger and I realized I had internalized, or well, I was fat phobic, not even internalized, I was fat phobic. And I had been fat phobic because I was always really little. Uh, and so from I came from the place where I was conventionally attractive and now shifted to um, unattractive in terms of, you know, these beauty standards that we've set and that we continue to perpetuate. And as my body has started to, a lot of people might argue with me, but I always say my body is like dying, you know, and as my body is dying, um, I, my scoliosis, scoliosis has gotten worse, you know, I have um, lipomas in the knees, I have them just under my breast, so if you see me in a photo, my body is like crooked, and I struggled with that a lot, and I remember talking about in the essay, you know, whether or not I should include the wheelchair photos, and me being in a wheelchair. At the time, I didn't I, I, I didn't see the chair as part of me. 
I saw the chair as a separate mm -hmm. thing. I saw it as a mobility aid rather than my my legs, basically. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, struggled a lot, still struggle with finding myself to be attracted. I have to like talk myself into saying, you look great, you know, you're beautiful, no matter what size you are, even the scoliosis, it just adds character to your body. Um, but it's very, very, like, it's very hard even for me to believe, you know, because I haven't gotten that validation, that external validation that we all need to affirm that yeah. we, we are attractive and so forth. Yes, so I have struggled a lot with body dysmorphia and I still do. Sometimes my assistant will take a hundred photos of me and I'll be like, I hate them all. And she'll be like, oh, but these ones are nice. And I'll be like, no, I hate them all just because my, of my insecurities with my body. But um, yeah, so, um, so, so spinal muscular atrophy obviously doesn't have a cure. But what I was told the diagnosis is that the only way to prolong the paralysis is physiotherapy. So I've been going to physiotherapy all my life, but um, in the last four years, I've actually been in the pool. So I'm in the pool two or three times a week doing exercises, you know, with my physiotherapist. And it's amazing, you know, the water's warm um, and I stand. I remember the first session I mm -hmm. went to, in 2018 and I was standing in the water because obviously of the, um, I forgot what it's called, the buoyance, buoyance daughter. And my mom oh, was yeah. at my session. Yeah, so my mom was at my session and I think it was her first time being there. And she watched me and she was like thrilled. She was like, she was like giggling like a little child. And she was like, but, and then she got home and she was like, but you, but you walk in, in the water and you can stand. Why can't you stand at home? And I had to explain to her that it's the water, you know. The water, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> that's been an exciting part of my life is just being in the pool, um, being on my legs, you know. But I, it, I'm not like longing to be in my legs when I get out, you know. I'm happy that I can stand in the pool, but I'm not like, oh man, I wish... I could do the same outside of the pool. So, so yeah, I left the pool two or three times a week. Um, I'm, I mean, it's part of my personality, but I'm a, I can't be, I don't want to be defeated person. So if you ever come to any of my sessions and my physiotherapy shows me no mercy, she's like, get your money up. Just like, your knees need to be high. Let's go cardio. And we do cardio. Yeah. Like, hectic and i'm like man i'm dying and she is like not nah, girl let's go let's go let's go <laughs> just and keep always, pushing you she pushes me and i keep and i always come in and i'm like oh christine you know i just want to take it easy today and she was like oh, okay sure then she's like boom let's go and i'm like oh my word i really want to take it easy so a lot of there's been so many challenges in the pool that i have risen to you know things like um threading water that's a really difficult thing threading water is like so hard but i'm like you know what me i'm never going to be defeated let's go let me go like let me let me do this like let me achieve this um uh, and i always show people my um my stats from my from my watch and i said in, in a post when i shared it um obviously my stats in terms of like kilojoules and, and 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 all of that are going to be low you know and people might be like why is she showing us that she like lost 200 kilojoules like you know we lose up to a thousand and all of that and i said to people yeah. we need to reimagine what fitness means and uh, in order to in order for it to be inclusive of bodies that cannot do traditional exercises. And I said to them, I show people my stats, no matter how silly they look to other people, to open people's minds and, 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 and about what fitness means to me. You know, I'm proud of my statistics. I'm not, I'm not thinking, 
um, let me go a little further. Oh, or my statistics are so silly, I shouldn't post them. I want to show people that my form of exercise is being in the pool. And that's, I don't need to go to the gym. I don't need to lift weights. And we need to validate what fitness means to bodies that are not conventional. And we need to affirm those yeah. people. We need to congratulate them and be like, oh my word, you are uh, you know, in the pool for 30 minutes doing exercise. That's amazing, you know? And so we, we, we need to collectively work towards that thing. And I think also if we, if we succeed in that, a lot of disabled people would have less body dysmorphia, you know? Um, and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there was so much, as you said, so many nuggets in there. Like I'm even thinking about, you know, my own fat phobia and how I think actually having the courage to like call that out. Yeah. And even talking about your own challenges with depression. Because I feel like, you know, when yeah. people see us confident, you feel like you have to put that front on like 24-7. I'm this confident person. And yeah. thank you for sharing that. Because yeah. I know, like, I think a lot of people struggle with showing that side of themselves. Yeah. Especially, I think, when you're talking on a public platform, you know, people think, oh, no, we only show our best selves on yeah. social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I have been equally as open with my disability as I am with my mental health. It took a long time because I had other forces, external forces, my family, you know, who um, invalidate this mental issue um, situation. And we know black parents, you know, don't believe in mental yeah. illness. They think it's witchcraft. They think it's the devil. They like moyom daga. And you're like, no, bro, it's a scientific thing. Like it's in the book. Somebody wrote about this thing years ago. It's a real, real thing. Um, and so I'm very open about that. And I'm open as well about the intersection of my mental illness with my disability, which is what a lot of people um, with disabilities face. You know, it's yeah. that cycle. It's like that vicious cycle um, where, you know, you're depressed about your body and, 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 and all of those things. And I think it's very, very important for us to have these honest conversations because we would save so many lives if we, if one person just said, you know, if someone who you've only seen as strong and invincible said, I've actually had bipolar for 12 years, that would be so life changing to a lot of people. And I'm open about also having, you know, bipolar. I'm open about my medication. I'm open about all of those things. I, I'm trying to, not, and not in, even in an active way, but I'm trying to just take the shame away from having, because it's, mm. it's not you, you know, it's, and, and people feel that way. They're like, you know, why me? Maybe it's a punishment for God, from God or whatever. And it's like, no, it's not you. You know, some of these things are genetic. Mental illness in, runs in my family. I have, an, I have an uncle who's bipolar. I have an aunt who committed suicide. She had schizophrenia, you know, and I was there when she committed suicide. And the family has always been like super hush hush about that and, and all of that. And now that I have a mental illness, I understand her so much. And I just wish she was here. You know, I just wish medicine had been advanced enough to, to, to give her proper treatment. I wish she, was, she hadn't lived in a rural community because her chances of survival would have been so much higher if she was in an urban area because Rural people used to say to her, you know, she's possessed or whatever, because obviously schizophrenia, you see things. And so mm. I, I, I feel like I owe it to her to shift the narrative about mental illness and who, it, who, who, who gets to have it. You know, um, even the best people have mental illness and struggle with that. So, so yeah. Yeah, I really love that, especially the part about um, dealing with the shame. So I feel like when things, I feel like shame allows things to fester. I feel like there's yes. so much yes. toxicity and negativity that happens when things are kept in shame. Whereas when it's brought to the light, that's when you can seek help. Because even like you said, with mental illnesses, because it runs in a family, if mm. I'm treating a patient and I know they have a history, like a family yes. history of mental illnesses, they'll know, okay, we should look out for it. And it can even yes. educate the patient, okay. 
you know, if you see these signs, it could be because, you know, you're starting to show these signs because of your family history. Exactly. And so I agree, like, you know, if you spoke, because I've had instances where I talk to a patient and I mm. ask, okay, are there any illnesses in your family? They're like, I don't know. My family, we don't talk about these things. Yeah. But there are people who were sick, who had this. And now it gets difficult for me as, like, you know, a future doctor. Like, how will I diagnose such a patient? Because some right. conditions you think of only because of, you know, there's a family history. This disease, we know it has a genetic component, so let's test for it. So I agree that we need more conversations. Like, I think I'm blessed that my family, we, they talk about illnesses. And yeah. even with mental health, like, if I've had an issue, like, my parents, they, they'd say, if you can't talk to us, at least talk to a counselor. Talk to a professional mm. and get the help that you need. And perhaps it's because my mom's a nurse that also, you know, helped maybe why she's a little bit more educated. And I understand it's, you know, I'm like the exception, not the norm. You know, mm. I realize I that I'm privileged in that sense. Mm. We, we, we need to normalize mental illness. You know, we need to mm-hmm. normalize disability as well. We need to stop looking at these things as a deviation from the norm. Um, they mm. are the norm, you know. Most people probably have undiagnosed mental illnesses. Um, and it's because we, we, we hush hush about these things. You know, we, we don't talk about them or, yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's probably, as our generation, it's probably one of the, the hardest things we've been basically tasked to do. Because I feel like it's up to us. Our generation has so many things that it it it's it's it 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 has been called to eradicate from our families, from our communities, from our society, um, including like how to parent, you know. Um, so there's so much that we've been tasked with, but I think um, destigmatizing mental illness is probably one of our biggest fights, and I believe we can get there, you know. Um, yes, maybe we can't change our parents or grandparents' perspective on it, but I just know that we, we, we shape in a new dawn where mental illness is, um, is the norm and we've normalized it, so. Yeah, that was beautiful. And, you know, I think at this point, I think because of time, we should maybe just wrap things up. Like, I think we could go on for Forever. hours. Like, I know. Like, I'm loving having you. So I think we'd have to re- have a nice schedule to have you come back. I love that. I love that. I love so that. Yeah. So I think just to close it off, um, final question. What is your favorite representation of any of your identities that you've seen in the media? Um, probably the black womanhood experience. And I am so excited um, about shows like Insecure that, mm. that just tell the stories of who black women are, you know, in their glory and in different forms, you know. Um, Insecure had different types of women and you could see yourself in at least one of those women. And so I think that's been, and these shows have been cropping up, you know, Um, many of them now are starting to get focused on the black womanhood experience and and not in relation to anything else, you know, they're not like, they're the stars of the show. They're not like supporting cast. They front Mm. and center, they leads. And I think that's been exciting for me to see when you are like, oh my word, Molly, um, you know, has been, let me close my battery. Molly has been, you know, hooking up with these guys. And you're like, but I can relate. And you're like, I can relate, you know? And yeah. They do it in a, yeah, they do it in a way where you, you don't you, you don't feel guilty or bad about the decisions that you've made as a black woman. You're just like, you know what, I'm in my 20s. I should be living this way. And so, yeah, black black womanhood has been the best representation I've seen in the media. But I, I, I'd like to see more disability representation and disability um, representation, not in medical shows where a disabled person is mm. getting help. I want to yeah. see like, a dating show um, for disabled people. 
I want to see like them go on dates. I want to see like a travel show, you know, and I've always said that um, I have a friend of mine in a wheelchair um, and I've always said, you know what? Um, I'd love for us to do a show where it's like Tembi and Yandi take New York. You know, a show I'd like love that. To see that. Yeah. Exactly. Where we just go around like living our best life and in the process, like rating restaurants, rating Airbnbs, rating other, um, you know, experiences on the scale of how accessible they are to disabled people. And we need shows like that. I don't want to see disabled mm -hmm. people as like, in, yeah, as like um, in a position or in a character where we feel sorry for them. You know, I want to see them play the lead. And I know, um, I think sex education is one of those shows that's trying to do that. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know, how yeah. disabled people, they're in the mix, um, being young, being free, living their best life in the same way you'd see non-disabled people. Yeah, that is beautiful. I think a perfect note to end the show. Before I let you go, where can people find you? Um, um, yeah, your social media links, all of that. Yeah, so on Twitter, it's Lily underscore Nye. And on Facebook, it's Tembilise Lily Nye. On uh, Twitter, it's Tembi underscore Lily. So you can catch me there and yeah, just engage with me. I love, I love talking to people. You know, you and I were such a little random meet, but it's been so fun. Yeah. We've had such a great time together. People would be like, I thought you guys were friends. I had been friends for years. And it's like, no, we just, this is us being for the first time. But we're clicking <laughs> and it's good vibes and we could go on forever. But yeah, so so that's where you can find me. And it's been such a pleasure being on this channel of yours. Thank you for being here, making the time. Yeah. And hopefully we can do this soon again. I'd love that. I really would. Yeah, this is, the, this is the closest people will get to me having my own YouTube channel. I'm, <laughs> gonna go, I'm just going to be featured on yours like every month, like a segment with you and I, Q&A on just politics of being disabled, politics of being young, politics, you know, of being um, LGBTQIA, all of those. So love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Let me release you now because I'll, I'll, I'll keep you hostage here. I know. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So there you have it, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, please do give this a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button if you're not yet subscribed. Or, you know, follow the podcast. Um, share the podcast. Give the podcast a five-star rating. Leave a good review. And also, check me out on social media. All of that information will be in the description of the YouTube channel. But also in the show notes of the podcast. And also, do follow Timbelike on all her various social media platforms. I had a blast. I hope you guys did too. And until I see you guys or you hear from me in the next one. I love you so much. Bye. Thank you.